and with that, those formalities out of the way, uh, if we Steve Foskett. Steve, are you ready to uh, get started? All right. So over to Steve Foskett, um, so our first international speaker for the day, uh, his keynote on virtual virtualization is a second mm -hmm. life. So welcome to the stage, Steve. Thank you. Here I am. Yeah. All right. Now, you all have a risk. Whenever I'm involved in anything, I'm a crazy photo taker. So I'm going to take all your photo, photo here. So everybody smile. It's already up on the, on the Twitter feed, too, so you're too late. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm going to switch over my laptop while I talk here a little bit. Uh, we tested it out earlier, so what could possibly go wrong? Technology always works. Ooh. Ready? Technology always works. Excellent. Excellent. Actually, I, uh, I'm going to stick your clicker in here, too. Oh, no, this was not injected properly. Okay. There we go. So, hello, everybody. Good morning. I'm Stephen Foskett. Again, um, as was mentioned, uh, I'm obviously not from Australia. Um, I won't even attempt a ridiculous crocodile Dundee accent. Uh, I was really, really surprised, though, about uh, the number of uh, killer koalas in this country. Um, luckily, I realized I, I, I was given some advice that if you put a little Vegemite on your ears, they'll stay away from you. So I've done that. But hopefully, the drop bears will leave me alone. Um, thank you, all you Australians, for your, your, your warm and helpful advice on that matter. Um, it's, it's been great. I've never actually even done it on this side of the Pacific before. So it's, uh, as you can see, if you look closely at me, I really wasn't prepared for the Pacific sun either. But uh, it's pretty cool to, to, to be here. When I left, I'll actually translate it to local numbers. When I left Cleveland, Ohio, my, the temperature was minus, well, it was a minus 17 Fahrenheit, which is, what's that, eight below? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, um, and so to get here was awfully nice. My wife actually cursed me this morning because there's six inches of snow on the ground in Cleveland. So, uh, but it's, it's nice to be here. Thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, I'm thrilled to, to be able to participate in these VMO conferences. Again, I want to second the the thanks to the, uh, the companies that sponsor this. It would not happen without these companies. Uh, I've gotten very, very familiar with a lot, of these, a lot of these companies over the years doing sessions like this. And um, I really appreciate that they're supporting this sort of user-focused VMUG activity. So, um, but some of you probably, in fact, most of you, in fact, all of you, probably don't have any idea who I am. So let's just start with that. Yes. I know who you are. What? I know you are. I'm from Denver. But... Oh, he knows who I am. OK, I see Kurt knows who I am. So, so we're good there. So I'm just some guy. Uh, I have to warn you, I don't work for any of these companies, which may become obvious as I continue with the talk this morning. Um, I'm just some guy. I'm a storage guy originally. I love storage. If you love storage, I'm also a badge guy. I have I love storage pins that you can put. I love storage, but I also love virtualization. And um, I've spent a few years now doing a seminar series on server virtualization and infrastructure for virtualization, uh, storage for virtualization for various different groups. Uh, never got out here, but I've done those things in London and on the continent and uh, in the United States, all over the, city, all over the US. So, um, I'm not saying that to show how great I am, just to let you know who, who, who it is that's talking to you this morning. You may know me as the Tech Field Day guy. Has anybody ever heard of Tech Field Day? We got some hands, all right. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm the guy who does that. Um, we've had Kurt participate, we've had Mike participate, Alistair, where are you? We'll get you, we'll get you. Uh, and I also participate in all sorts of craziness. Um, you may have heard of Fiber Channel over Token Ring. You know, the only thing that makes more sense than fiber channel over ethernet, fiber channel over token ring. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm active in the Twitters and that sort of thing. So uh, that's actually how I kind of got in, got this invite even as well, is, you know, from blogging and tweeting and all that and getting to know people. So, so that's who I am. I don't work for companies. I used to be a technology guy. I used to be a systems administrator. I'm a Unix guy, so forgive <laughs> my anger towards Microsoft. Um, I, uh, I, I, I love Microsoft, too. I'm also a Microsoft MVP. Uh, VM work, the expert, and all that. So that's that's who I am. So let me start. Virtualization is a stack of lies. I proposed a few different ideas for what I could talk to you about this morning on a spectrum of least offensive to most, well, let's say controversial. Happily, they didn't choose the puff piece, but they didn't choose the most controversial thing. Even though it sounds like it is, virtualization is a stack of lies. Let me start with cloud. I'm sure you're all sick of cloud, right? Um, I know I am. Virtualization is not cloud. In fact, they're probably the opposite of each other. Virtualization is all about maintaining continuity. And as an enterprise IT guy, I really, really respect that. It's very important to maintain compatibility, to move forward based on what you have instead of what you don't have. There's a lot of sort of cloud fear and cloud scares that are going out there, people thinking, you know, oh, the cloud is the end of IT, the cloud is the end of my job, it's the end of everything as we know it. And then there's a lot of cloud washing which says basically everything's cloud, so no, no worries. Well, the truth is it's, it's you know, cloud is important. And um, I've been looking at a lot of the, the cloud infrastructure products. I, I worked for Nervonix for a year doing um, enterprise cloud storage consulting. And um, it's important. But the problem is that cloud is really, let's just throw everything out. Let's do something totally different. Whereas virtualization is all about maintaining compatibility, maintaining forward looking as, as well as backward looking. And that is a, um, a real fundamental strategy shift. But how does, how does virtualization do this? And that's probably the most important thing. And that is really sort of at the core of what I want to talk about. So what are we building? Well, frankly, we're building a stack of lies. And that gives us all sorts of problems. It gives us all sorts of technical problems. I'm going to spend most of my time talking tech here, uh, even though it may not sound like it. I'm sure you've all seen something like this, where we've got a uh, a stack, right? We've got storage, we've got networking, oh, it's a cloud. We've got server hardware, and we've got some virtual machines. When I say a stack, this is what I mean by a stack. It's a stack of independent entities that are all expected to work together. And virtualization is the essential technology that ties all that together. So what does it mean? What is virtual? Well, virtualization is really abstraction, right? It means that I'm going to take what I say I'm doing and I'm going to put up a wall so that you don't know what I'm actually doing. And virtualization predates VMware by a good margin. I mean, as storage people, people who love storage as much as I do know, storage virtualization has been around for quite a while. I mean, we, uh, there were a whole bunch of products, whole wave of products in the late 90s, but it even, it even goes before that. And if you think about it, RAID, is virtualization. RAID is virtualization for disks. And we can learn a lot by looking at those previous waves of virtualization and seeing what it means for server virtualization, for client, for the future. So if you think about what did RAID do? Well, it abstracted things. So instead of having proprietary interfaces, one of the big uh, advancements of the 1970s in computing was when IBM came out with a standard disk interface. And then in the 1980s, we had SCSI as a standard interface. So you could plug a disk from uh, any of the 500 different disk vendors that existed back there. Now there's two. Isn't that sad? It's kind of like, I don't know, Toyota and Volkswagen or something nowadays. But, but back then, it was a huge, crazy mess of hundreds and hundreds of different companies. But SCSI brought all that together. It was a standard interface. So in fact, SCSI is virtualization. Then we got RAID. And what does RAID do? Well, RAID is all about aggregation. It brings multiple physical disks together and makes them appear to be one 
virtual disk, one fake disk. And so those of us in the storage community often will refer to di uh, disks and SCSI and everything, we'll refer to that as fake disks. LUN is a fake disk, basically. It's a fake disk presented over a fake channel that thinks that it's a bus instead of a network. Well, so aggregation combines multiple elements. Other types of virtualization do this as well. It's harder to see it in server virtualization because, of course, servers still are a unbreakable barrier when it comes to scaling workloads, right? It's really hard to go beyond a physical server when you're talking about operating systems and applications. And there's a real good reason for that. We'll probably get into that. Um, but there is aggregation. If you think about what, what DRS does, it really is aggregation of server hardware. And that's really exciting to people like me who get really excited by things like that. Because it means that we can finally have something like a scale-out server environment, which we've never been able to do before. In the past, servers were always scale-up. Storage, again, storage has often been scale-up, even though we have aggregation of disks in RAID, because it's very, very difficult to make anything scale-out. But storage is becoming scale out as well. Everything's becoming scale out. But what's happening in order to enable this is basically a bunch of lies, as we're going to get into. Then there's a third thing, actually, that I want to point out here in terms of virtualization. Uh oh, this thing stopped working. Oh well, I'll do it the old fashioned way. This thing stopped working. There we go. I'll do it the old, old-fashioned way. I'll actually touch it. All right. So the other thing that RAID does, and, and that SCSI does, and that VMware does, and that Microsoft and Citrix, and all these virtualization products do, is they simplify things. Uh, when I was a systems administrator, um, and later when I was a consultant, I used to do a lot of DR work. And those of us, I guess we're all friends here, right? Everybody here is not on the evil side of the business, right? We all know the truth about virtual about DR, right? That it just <laughs> doesn't work. There's no possible way to do an effective DR without all sorts of stuff, without simplification, without virtualization. In fact, in my opinion, the reason that VMware has been a success is all about DR. I think that's the killer app for virtualization. Because simplification, because when I tried to do DR tests, I remember spending a week in Philadelphia in a former tank factory trying to bring a bank state, you know, entire systems back online. We finally declared victory and went home, even though we hadn't actually gotten anything to work. Because we ran into ridiculous things like firmware versions and which, you know, NIC do we have, which HBA, and which driver do we have, and oh no, I don't have the right, you know, all that stuff is simplified. Virtualization changes all that, just like in the days when there was a thousand different disk interfaces and then you had SCSI. There are a thousand different hardware interfaces and then you have ESX. And suddenly, things are simplified. The problem is that abstraction, aggregation, simplification, you know, there's a word for that. There's a word that means these things. And that word, if I can get it to work, Lies. That's what I mean when I say that virtualization is a stack of lies. It is a stack of lies. It's lying. Everything's lying to the thing that it talks to. And it's lying in aggressive and perhaps even damaging ways. I mean, one of the issues that, um, you know, that we saw with SCSI, right, is that different disks may have different performance characteristics. Well, that's all wiped away. That information is no longer communicated. What happens about you know, a standard hardware interface? That's all wiped away. Now some people might say, well what, that, what that does is it, it leads to commodification and it hurts the vendors and the vendors' ability to compete with each other. And a lot of people were really concerned about that. When VMware started to rise, everybody's running storage through the VMFS. What does that mean for storage vendors? I imagine there's one big storage vendor that was very concerned about that, you know, in fact, that, that you know, having commodity storage under VMware would cut into their business, and they seem to have had some influence. So, in the United States, we have this game called Telephone. Thanks to the glory of the Wikipedia, I learned that it's not called Telephone here, or at least anywhere else outside the United States, it's called Chinese Whispers. 
And you, I'm sure that everybody's played this, right? You know, you, you whisper something, and it goes to the next person, and it goes to the next person. By the time it's done, it's a completely different message, right? Think about your infrastructure stack in this context. Basically, you have a stack that's lying at every level. So I put up a storage stack here because I'm that kind of person. Um, applications, applications don't speak SCSI. Applications don't even speak file. They speak CRUD, create, create, update, delete. They have their own APIs. Maybe some applications can talk directly to a file. Maybe some can even talk directly to a SCSI one, but those are crazy people. Basically, applications are virtualized by the operating system and the file system. And the file system says anything you've got under this application, whether it's an SSD or a local disk or an NFS you know, remote disk or a SCSI disk over fiber channel or even, yes, cloud storage through some kind of gateway or object storage or something really exotic. It just, it's just a file system. Pay no mind, pay no attention. So even there, way, way up in the stack, we have abstraction and simplification that changes everything that goes on below it. Below that, we've got the file system. Well, the file system thinks it's writing to a plain old disk, right? It thinks it's writing you know, just to block storage. Well, it's not. Every operating system now has a volume manager. And if you're a storage long nerd like me, you get excited about volume managers. You know what the last operating system, major operating system to have a volume manager was? This one. <laughs> Mac OS. They, they, they lasted the longest talking to directly to, to disks. But even now, even Mac has a volume manager. And what it does is it abstracts. It's making fake disks above the operating system level. And those fake disks have file systems on them. And those file systems have applications running on them. And we go down the stack, the operating system. How many operating systems expose the true semantics of SCSI or NFS? None of them. They all hide what's going on. They're all abstracting and virtualizing. And we go down into the network, into the switches, into storage virtualization. And then we wedge VMware in here. Well, what does VMware do? The first thing it does is put in the MFS, You've got a clustered file system, you've got SCSI, maybe you've got NFS, maybe you've got, in the future, uh, distributed storage. And by the way, if you're really interested in this topic, there's a great session later today called the I.O. Blender. And this awesome, thoughtful, wonderful person is going to be presenting that session, so I would happily go to that one if I were you. Um, <laughs> and we can talk about this some more. Um, so the hypervisor also changes storage. In fact, I would go so far as to say that VMware has built and sold the most successful storage array in the history of enterprise computing. If you think about VMFS as a storage array, it really, really is. It really is the most successful, the only successful storage virtualization product on the market. And yet, it goes down. And so what happens? Well, imagine you are a storage array. No, no, no. Imagine you are a disk way down at the bottom of that stack. Remember. Um, Dr. Seuss and the turtles are all stacked up on each other. That's you. At every level, everything is abstracted away. And whenever it's abstracted, the information is removed. So maybe you're running an ERP system. Maybe you're running email. Maybe you're storing somebody's JPEG files. Maybe it's, you have no idea. Maybe we're doing a DR. Maybe we're doing replication. Maybe, you know. It's a highly business critical application. You have no idea. Maybe there's a cache above you. Probably there is, but you have no idea. Unfortunately, way down at the bottom, basically you can't do anything. If you're a disk drive, you can't do anything cool, anything exotic. You don't have any information. And similarly, at the top, you're an application. You need your storage to exist simultaneously in two locations across the continent. Ooh, you can't tell your app your storage to do that. There's no communication at all. The only communication is this, this, this chain of Chinese whispers that says, I need to open some data 
and then it says, I need a file, and then it says, I need a block, and so on, and so on, all the way down to the chain. So all you, the only information that passes from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack is the most basic, worthless information possible. And this is not just true for storage. This is true for networking. The area of the world of network virtualization is ripe for change. In fact, it's begging for change because network devices have no idea what application is running on them. And now, some network admins have been willfully ignorant. Well, that's just an application. I heard that last night. There he is. Yep. Yes, that's just an application. It's true, everything's an application. But unfortunately, if you don't know anything about the application, if the application has no way to tell you anything about it, what are you going to do? You know, it's like uh, one of those container ships across the Pacific. Could be anything in those boxes. What are you going to do? The same thing is true even for you know CPUs and memory. If, if you look at all the craziness that goes into virtualization-enabled CPU hardware and and and, and, and registers and, and oh my gosh, that is just nuts. Again, just because there's no information that traverses the stack. It's more difficult, in my opinion, it's more difficult with storage. In fact, it's most difficult with storage because storage is such a fully developed stack. You have intelligent devices in multiple locations throughout the stack, and all of them are trying to do intelligent, useful things. So layers translate, layers simplify, layers break communication. So this sounds pretty bad, but it's not. Uh, yes. I'm trying to shock you by saying it's a stack of lies. Lies aren't always bad things. Sometimes lies are good, but lies almost always cause trouble for someone, right? I actually uh, you know, spent a little time philosophizing about this. We've got a whole bunch of different types of lies. I mean, can you imagine what you can do here? Some of these aren't so bad, right? Um, you know, it's, it's okay to tell somebody a lie if their life is in danger, right? It's okay. In fact, uh, Plato has a whole uh, philosophical argument that it's okay to lie for the greater good of society. That's virtualization right there. Virtualization is telling an, an acceptable lie because think of the benefits out of it. It's a very, very good reason to lie, right? We get operational efficiency? Yeah. Can I, can I ask why Richard Nixon was up there on the side of the well, you know, how many American presidents could I put up there? You know, I, mean, I certainly could. Uh, yeah, I certainly could have put Richard Nixon. I certainly could have put Bill Clinton. Uh, you know, George Bush. There, there, are, there are a number of them. Small choice. Yes, yes. I'm sure that there are some famous uh, lying politicians in us. Wait, are you guys? There's no nobody ever lies here. Nobody? Yeah, British prime ministers there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I, I picked some uh, some examples. So it's, it's, it, virtualization is, is really, really beneficial. Now, one of the things I'd like to talk about when I talk about virtualization is that, that people often talk about it all wrong. People often run back to operational efficiency. Like, virtualization is great because I can provision a server with one click in you know, a couple, I heard that the other day, somebody was saying, um, you know, can you imagine if you could provision uh, hardware as quickly as you can provision virtual servers? Isn't that a great benefit? Isn't that a reason to go buy VMware? It's a reason for you. It's a reason for me, but I don't have a million dollars. And I don't have any kind of budget. Operational efficiency is a, is a nice to have. The other thing I like to hear, I hear about a lot with um, server virtualization is the rack of 10 servers now running on one server argument. Again, that's a great thing. I love that. That is a benefit of virtualization. It's not the killer benefit. It's not probably worth it for everybody. In fact, if this was VMware's argument, they would probably not have been a successful company. If they just went out there and said, guess what? You can only buy one server instead of 10 servers. And that was the end of the discussion. This is one of those things that allows us to justify things. The truth is that VMware and other virtualization products are incredibly valuable for the things that they let you do that you never could do before, primarily DR. HA, you know, um, things that work. I worked at a, a Swiss bank for a while, and uh, we had 
the most remarkable infrastructure, pre-virtualization days, set up for the uh, investment bankers to use. They needed to basically spin up hundreds of machines and storage and networks and everything whenever anybody had a bright idea that they wanted to try out. And so we literally provisioned data centers, hundreds and hundreds of physical servers, and we wrote our own software that allowed the investment bankers to basically create a data center on a whim without virtualization. And that was, I can't imagine how much money the bank spent to be able to do that, but it was remarkable. As, a, as an IT guy, it was really, really amazing, eye-opening for me. I can do that on this laptop now, and so can you. That's remarkable. The idea that you can build an environment on a whim, that you can then take that environment and put it into production, that you can move it to bigger and better hardware, that you can reconfigure your environment, that's the killer app for virtualization. And that's why it's okay. That's why even as a picky storage guy, a pedantic storage guy, who would certainly argue about protocol overheads all day long, I'm okay with adding layer upon layer of virtualization that destroys everything I care about. Because what I really care about is having an environment that's useful. And this is incredibly useful. The problem is that it's all going to come home to roost once you try to push the limits, once you try to have a virtualization environment that goes beyond what you may expect, you need to be able to, you need to be able to adapt. You need to be able to let the various components do what they do best. Again, uh, in my I O Wonder talk, I'm gonna go into this in a lot of detail with storage arrays. Storage arrays do a few things very, very well. Moving data, sharing data, accelerating data access. All of that is broken by the stack of lies. And that was basically an existential crisis for the enterprise storage industry. Because effectively, you have an industry that spent 15 years building these remarkable, intelligent, adaptive, functional machines that are no longer useful at all in a virtualization environment because virtualization destroys the guesses that they were making about the infrastructure needs above them. So we have to bring some honesty here, and we have to figure out how we can cut through the stack. How can we, I got tried to find the least offensive picture I could. Um, how can we cut through the crap and figure out a way to allow the various infrastructure components to function the way they should function. And VMware has done a remarkable job of that. I have to give, I have to give VMware a huge amount of credit. Again, as an enterprise storage guy, I, I was active in storage in the early 90s. There is no excuse for the fact that no file system had any kind of storage hinting communication, out of band communication, for 20 years. There's no excuse that nobody thought of that. There's no excuse at all. VMware, VAAI, I've often said was the most important thing to happen to storage in a decade. Not because it was particularly critical for every storage person. I mean, you could probably say, well, no, 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 SSD was more important because it has more impact on more people in day-to-day -day lives and so on. No, I mean philosophically. VAAI was incredibly important, because what does VAAI do? It cuts through the stack. It cuts through the lies. VAAI is basically an out-of-band communication mechanism. So storage still works the way it always did, whether it's NFS or SCSI, but there's another communication mechanism, and the hypervisor can tell the storage array essential information. Essential information that lets it do what it does best. Essentially, without VAAI, Enterprise storage would be pretty much worthless. Without the AI, the only way to get acceptable performance or usability out of server virtualization would be to throw SSDs at it and to move to virtual storage arrays. That's basically the answer. Um, with the AI, enterprise storage has not only not died, but has grown remarkably. And in fact, if you look at these companies that are selling storage devices today, I mean, I'm sure that we've got, I don't want to mention any companies because basically everybody who supports VAAI, and you ask them, 
hey, why are customers buying storage? Why, why does somebody come to you, XYZ company, and buy a new storage array or a new SAN? The answer is VMware. Done. It's always VMware. That's the power, in my opinion, the power of the AI. NFS actually, truthfully, has similar benefits because less information is lost. Basically, enough hints are, remain in NFS as a file protocol that the storage arrays can continue to do things that storage arrays like to do. That's not to say that NFS is a miracle cure for the stack. It's, it just takes less information out than SCSI does. Other things, uh, VASA has been a colossal flop and disappointment in my opinion. But it could end up being just as remarkable and important as VAAI. Why? Because it's a communication mechanism that lets you cut through the stack. There's never been a way for a file system to know what's going on on the storage below it. Again, why didn't any of those Unix companies, why didn't Microsoft do this? Why didn't IBM do this? Why didn't any company have an out-of-band communication mechanism that allowed you to profile storage? Nobody ever did that. Again, it's, it's really, really remarkable. Uh, you look at all these other technologies. Um, I love the IO, you guys know what the IO injector is? vSphere 5.1? It, it's one of those like, like asterisk features. I mean, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's one of the coolest features in 5.1, and nobody's heard of it. Okay, how, how cool is this? It's a lie detector. What it does is when you bring some storage into vSphere 5.1, it'll actually do some I.O. to it, and it'll detect the performance characteristics of that storage, and it'll use that to tune storage DRS, storage I.O. control, adaptive queuing. That's cool. That's a really remarkable feature. Why didn't everybody do that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? If you Linux guys are so smart, anyway, I'm a Linux guy. Uh, but I, it makes me crazy. I didn't think of it. Um, so what's happening is that VMware is pushing the limits. And if you think about the technologies that they're introducing, even the ones that nobody's heard of, it's all about cutting through the stack. It's all about improving communications. It's about basically, if you think of that Chinese whisper team, it's about basically being able to tell the guy two or three people down from you what you heard and cutting off all of the abstraction and simplification that's happened since then. But unfortunately, none of this goes all the way from end to end. In order to have real, real, like no communication loss, in order to have real adaptive storage or adaptive networking, what you need is an entirely new programming paradigm, an entirely new programming environment. Basically, you need cloud, real cloud, big cloud, you know? Unfortunately, for real people with real applications and real operating systems, that's just not gonna happen. The best we can do are partial efforts to cure this problem or this problem. Things like trim, the idea that you can have the file system send a message all the way down, that tunnels all the way down to the underlying storage, to clear some space you no longer need. Things like ODX. Has anybody even heard of ODX? Yeah, we got a couple people, a couple people. ODX, well, to put it very, very overly excessively simply and wrong, ODX is basically Microsoft VAAI. That's not right, but it's, think about it that way. It's a way for the operating system to communicate some things with the underlying storage. It's part of the uh, Windows Server 2012, it's part of Hyper-V version three. Um, I will happily talk to you about it later. <laughs> Essentially, it's, 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 it's a little, another one of these communication mechanisms. It's another way to get the important information from the top of the stack or the middle of the stack down. So what happens? Well, VMware. VMware is fundamentally a hypervisor-centric company. Even though VMware is not a hypervisor company, and I, again, I need to give them a pat on the back, if VMware still thought that ESX was their product, well, we wouldn't be at a conference right now, would we? Um, they're, not, they're not selling hypervisors. 
I know it sounds ridiculous in Madison Avenue to say it, but they're selling an experience. They're selling this right here. This is VMware's real product. The idea that all these people want to get together with all these companies, that companies want to write products that run in a certain environment, that, that, that few people want to use this product. That's the VMware product. The hypervisor is almost incidental. And in fact, VMware recognized that's why it's free. It, it is not their product. But they're a hypervisor-centric company. If you think about, if, if you just take a step back and think, well, what is VMware doing about the stack of lies? It's all about communication between the hypervisor and underlying infrastructure elements. It's not about the operating system. It's really not about the application. Now, of course, there are higher level application uh, attempts that have been made. I think those were a very good idea. Um, I think that's what you need to do. Eventually, you're gonna need to go into the operating system. You're gonna need to go into the application. But for now, most of VMware's efforts have been focused on better integration between the hypervisor and the hardware, and figuring out a way to tell the hardware what the hypervisor needs. And we're gonna see that continue. Microsoft, well, what does Microsoft sell? They sell applications and operating systems. Most of what Microsoft does, and I think this is actually a mistake on their part, is not application integration, but operating system integration. If you look at a lot of the improvements in Windows Server 2012, and again, I can go into that if you like, a lot of the technology improvements in Server 2012 are actually very similar to what VMware is trying to do with hypervisor integration. It's trying to make the operating system work better with the underlying hardware components that it can't even see. And so that explains ODX, and that explains a lot of the other technologies that have been brought into what Microsoft is doing. Microsoft also sees the, the hypervisor as almost incidental to this mission, which is again, why they you know, give it away. They don't, I, 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 is there a Microsoft virtualization user group? I don't see it. Um, well, maybe there will be. Um, maybe they'll catch on, but for now, they're really operating system focused. And all of the things that they're doing are, are, look like that. Now, infrastructure companies, I see a lot of infrastructure companies doing similar things and proposing ways to better communicate around them. So you see a storage company trying to build the best storage for VMware, or we're the best storage for Citrix, um, you know, desktop virtualization. We're the best storage for this application, you know, we built a Hadoop specific thing. What are, it, it, stay, take a step back. What are they doing? It's all about me, isn't it? I'm building the best storage platform for this, or storage platform for that. It's all about integration and cutting through the stack from wherever they see it. And if you think about it, that, that's the same for Microsoft, the same for VMware. Everybody sees it that way. Cloud is different. Real cloud is all about application centric, and they, could, they don't care about what's going on down below. It's all abstracted away. So what can they do? Well, there are essentially three things that you can do when confronted by a lie. And these are, again, illustrative of what's going on in the industry. You can make do. You can say, well, they're lying. I gotta figure out some way to work with this. I gotta figure out some way to adapt. So what can I do? Well. That's a great example of what you can do when confronted with too little information. I can make the best of it. I can set up my IO queues so that when I run into trouble, I back off. I reduce the size of the queue so that I won't run into trouble again, hopefully. If you think about it, that's really kind of the same attitude that people have when they're confronted by all sorts of regular day-to-day -day troubles. You know, your, your, your kid stays out later than you ask him to, and then he lies about it. No, 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 I was home at nine, whatever. Well, what can you do in that situation? You can confront him, or you can deal with it, right? Well, if you deal with it, then you figure out some way of creatively enforcing your curfew without having to cause a big fight or something like that. You make do. There's been a lot of make do technologies out there. You can cut through. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I lost my report card. I don't know what grades I got this time. Um, you can go ask the teacher, right? Same thing here, you know, you can cut through. That's what VAAI does. It says, you know what? I'm not gonna trust the very limited information I get from this fake disk, this LUN. 
I'm going to ask the array. I'm going to tell the array. I'm going to say, Mr. Array, I need you to clear these blocks. Can you do that for me, please? A lot of the efforts in, uh, in storage are focused on this. If you think about what, you know, why, why is the other one want this here? Well, think about it this way. Think about it as a way to cut through the, oh, it's just an application argument, and actually be able to talk to the network hardware in some way. It's a step. It's a first step. It's moving in that direction. The other thing you can do is you can eliminate it. You can say, guess what? I'm not going to deal with you anymore. I'm going to forget storage arrays and fake disks and all this kind of stuff. I'm going to have a totally new way of addressing storage. I'm going to have my own way of doing this. I'm going to have vFlash. I'm going to invent from whole cloth a new API that lets me do what I want to do. And if anybody wants to get on board with me, they can. And if they don't, well, tough luck. This is where I'm going. It's funny, VMware seems to be of two minds about this. Um, certainly they're continuing to adapt, make do. They're continuing to cut through. And they're also continuing to reinvent. And it's funny, you look at a lot of the, uh, the efforts that happen and a lot of the new technologies and announcements, they're kind of of two minds. They're saying, on the one hand, we're going to work with legacy hardware and hardware OEMs and storage partners and make all their stuff work great. That's sort of the VAI message. And on the other hand, we're inventing a totally new way to work with storage. And in a way, one of the reasons I think that Nasira has got the networking industry totally in a titter and confused and crazy is because it's both. It's a way to cut through, and it's a way to reinvent. We'll see how that works out. But um, you know, I, I, I've been puzzled by that. But honestly, it makes sense. Imagine if you were VMware, and if, if your strategy was just one of those things. Imagine if your strategy was make do and cut through. Somebody would invent the heck out of you and walk right past, and that would be the end of it, right? Imagine if your strategy was, forget you hardware OEMs, I'm inventing something new. What would happen? The hardware OEMs would say, forget you, I'm not working with you. Somebody else would rise up. In, in a way, they have to do this. They have to keep inventing, but they also have to keep adapting. It's, it's different um, with, with other companies who aren't in that situation. Um, who's going to win? This is probably the question that I get the most. I do seminars, again, on, on, on virtualization with a little v, you know, not VMware seminars, not Microsoft or anybody else's seminars. Virtualization, I talk about virtualization. Yeah, I talk about Microsoft, I talk about VMware, I talk about everybody. But at the end of the thing, there's always some guy raising his hand and saying, well, who's gonna win? Is it gonna be Microsoft? What about Microsoft? My boss thinks it's gonna be Microsoft, right? Well, whoever has, you know, whoever can do this, if, if you accept my argument that the stack of lies is the fundamental technical limitation of virtualization, then whoever can best overcome that, whoever can best cut through the stack or invent around the stack has a major technology advantage, don't they? because their stuff works better. Think about what happened, I don't know, have you, has any of you, you got a good storage array, you turn on VAI and do a, a vMotion? Have you seen this? It's like night and day. That's a technology advantage. That's a killer advantage. Guess what, try that with Server 2012 on an array that supports ODX. You'll be, again, it's gonna be one of those, oh, like I, I got an SSD on my laptop, I can't live without an SSD now. I mean, I spent, what, how many years using a hard drive? I got so frustrated that I, I ripped up my wife's laptop and put an SSD in that one because I had to use it once, right? It's, it's something you just can't live without. VAI, you can't live without once you've, once you've tried it with an appropriate array. A lot of this stuff is like that. Whoever can figure out a way to cut through the stack and make this stuff really work has a huge technology advantage. But what do we know about technology advantages? 
That doesn't always determine who wins. The best technology doesn't determine what happened to the Death Star. You know, I mean, think about it. Whoever has the best, tech, best technology doesn't always win. And then there's the other thing. There's the dark horse in the room. And this is another one of those common questions that I'll get in my seminars. Somebody will say, but what about cloud? Well, cloud is definitely a, um, ah, it went the wrong way. Cloud is definitely a dark horse. And it's definitely threatening. And I will tell you this. So, I, so I, again, I'm a Microsoft MVP. What does that mean? That means that Microsoft invites me to Redmond and gives me insider briefings. Actually, you want to know what it doesn't mean? It, it means I don't have an NDA and I don't actually know about anything before you guys do, unfortunately. But people think it does. People think that I must know what's going to be in the server 2014 or something. Nope. Except based on what I talk about with the people. But what it does do is it lets me deal with a whole bunch of people in Redmond and see how they really write software and see what their thought process is. And sometimes that's pretty scary. Let me tell you, I'll explain. If you want an explanation of Windows 8, I've got one for you. We can talk about that anytime you like. Um, but what it also does is it lets me see literally 12,000 other people out there. The vast majority of Microsoft MVPs are developers, not infrastructure people like me. And when I talk to those developers, these are the people who are literally writing all of the enterprise software that all of your enterprise sites are using. All of those people, and I mean all of those people, I'm not exaggerating here, all of those people have given up on everything we do. They've all given up on infrastructure. They're all writing C Sharp and Azure. They're all working on platform as a service. And when people say, well, what about cloud? What does cloud do to everything we are building here? Well, certainly one thing we can say, and I feel very confident of this, is that everything we're building here is not going away anytime soon. How many mainframes are there out there, right? I mean, how many, you know, mini computers? How, you know, I, this is not going away. But it's kind of damning with faint praise to say, you guys will be just like the mainframers, right? I mean, that's, that doesn't make us feel real good, does it? It's not quite that bad, and it's not gonna be that bad. But platform, as a service and cloud is real, it's coming. I've seen 8,000 enterprise software developers writing the next generation of applications and it walks past everything we use. That's why, again, it was brilliant for VMware to get into that space because otherwise things were moving in. Maybe not today and maybe not tomorrow, but soon there's gonna be an application. I don't know what it does. I probably couldn't describe it. I probably couldn't imagine what it is. But it's going to be a must-have enterprise application. And it's going to require platform and cloud. And your business is going to adopt it. And it's going to become a major thing. And that won't kill everything you have. And you'll still have SQL Server. And you'll still have Oracle. And you'll still have everything you have today. But you'll also have this new thing. Basically, IT is about to splinch into multiple another direction. So you'll have your mainframe, and you'll have your virtualized open system servers, and you'll have your cloud application. So it is a dark, it is a dark horse. It threatens to steal the focus. It threatens to steal the developers. It threatens to steal what you're doing. But it's not going to change the fact that infrastructure is still valuable. Virtualization is incredibly valuable for infrastructure. And that's how it's, that's how it's going to be. So, with that, I'm Stephen Foskett. I hope that this gives you some things to think about. I hope that while you're looking at the products here at the DMUG, while you're looking, you know, hearing about the technologies, I hope that you'll be thinking, in what way is virtualization destroying communication? How does that impact the ability of the systems to work? And how is this cutting through the stack of lies to make the system work better? And I think what you'll find is that pretty much everything that gets discussed today is either a problem due to the stack of lies or a solution to the stack of lies. And hopefully this has given you something to think about strategically. And also, as you see things come down, as you see VDS announced, 
as you see sort of the next generation of vSphere. I'm feeling fairly confident that there will be another revision. I'm also feeling confident that most of what they're going to be doing there in terms of technology advancements is going to be about improving communication between layers in the stack. So with that, I think we're pretty much on time here. I tried to, I tried to stick to the, to the clock. Am I on time? Does anybody know? We're good. No, not you. Anybody else? No, yes. I'm personally disappointed that the US government did not approve the building of Tesla. <laughs> no! No, we do not approve of destroying planets and civilizations. I love their response. There was a very witty response in there about uh, given that technology was defeated by a single X wing fighter, uh, yeah. 80 trillion, trillion, trillion dollars on something that could be so easy to destroy. And, and judging by the to home, but uh, there you go, yeah. Uh, all right, anybody else? Um, I have a serious question. A serious question? Oh, I was just going to ignore you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Which is, there seems to be this fork in the road between those people who think storage should, should still be outside of the server, that the server should be this stainless thing, mm -hmm. and VMware has this fork and deploy thing, which assumes there's no storage in the box at all. And then there's these other guys who say, no, 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 the storage has to But um, in my real opinion is that the only good answer to that question is one or the other. The only bad answer is trying to combine both. I think it's, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to try to live in two camps in terms of having enterprise storage that is integrated and having next generation non-storage that's integrated. I think it's going to be real difficult to do both. I think that they're both really good solutions. That's another question that I get a lot. There, people will say, well, what about VSA? What about you know, your Nutanix of the world? You know, what about vFlash? What about VDS? VDS is, wow. It really is wow. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> that's a good quote. OK, so um, and the answer is, yeah, it is. It's kind of like what I said. I mean, VMware has to live in both camps. And you have to pick one. That's, that's basically my advice to you. Just not knowing what, you, what your environment looks like, my advice is pick one. Pick a really good enterprise storage system with NFS or Fiber Channel or iSCSI. NFS is fine. Um, or pick a awesome integrated scale out software defined whatever you want to call it, storage thing. Storage thing, that's it. the new term for it, a storage thing. Don't try to do both. Don't try to live in both worlds. And, um, and we'll see which one wins. Uh, long term, if I had to bet, I would bet on the storage thing. Because everything goes towards software. But we'll see. So that's my opinion. All right. And also, I have a big bag of buttons if anybody wants to show their storage or virtualization pride. Come on up and join me. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's nice to be here in Sydney. Uh,